My name is Kate Hopkins, audiologist and owner of Hopkins Hearing Health. Among my responsibilities as an audiologist is the provision and care of hearing aids, both what hearing aids can and can't do, as well as their basic functioning. The biggest thing you need to understand about hearing aids is that they are not a cure for hearing. They are better viewed as a prosthetic device, and like any prosthesis, they require maintenance and a lot of patience. But the rewards from hearing aids and the quality of life improvement is well worth it. In its simplest form, hearing can be divided into two parts. There is the sensory part that takes place in the ear. This is the part that hearing aids try to replicate. Then there is the central part that occurs in the brain. This is where speech and environmental sounds are decoded into something meaningful. So the hearing aids deliver sounds to the brain where the brain then makes sense of that input. One of the many things that make treatment of hearing loss difficult is that once the brain has stopped hearing things, it can forget how to decode those sounds into something meaningful, and those sounds then become noise. So when someone puts hearing aids in their ears for the first time and hears things that they haven't heard in years, it can be a little bit overwhelming. A little bit like having lived in a dark room for years and then suddenly stepping out into the sunlight. To return to the analogy of a prosthetic leg, you likely wouldn't expect to run a marathon with it. Likewise, regaining 100% of hearing is not realistic with the use of hearing aids. In general, we look for about a 70% improvement in ease of communication. Ease meaning less repeats and less communication fatigue. Another 10% of improvement can be found with the use of assistive devices like amplified phones or FM systems. I often tell my patients that hearing aids are not like buying a pill to cure your hearing. They are better thought of as physical therapy for your ear. The more time someone spends with a properly functioning hearing aid in their ear, the better their functional communication will be. Several studies have shown that a lack of auditory stimulation from not wearing a hearing aid results in a diminished ability to understand speech, even when speech is loud enough for them to hear. So the old analogy of if you don't use it, you lose it, applies to hearing as well. Your audiologist is your partner and hearing trainer. A person who uses hearing aids should not go longer than four months without a visit to their audiologist. During those visits, a deep cleaning of the hearing aid will be performed, any sound adjustments will be programmed, and the ear canal will be checked for excessive earwax. In fact, included with the cost of your hearing aids are years of service and maintenance, and this is where your audiologist employs their knowledge about the science of hearing and combines that with her clinical experience of the human mind, creating a hearing care program that is specifically designed for the individual. Your partnership with your audiologist doesn't end with the purchase of a hearing aid. That's where it begins. Often, diminished hearing can resemble dementia and certainly results in frustration, isolation, loneliness, and may contribute to depression. For many individuals, one of the most important things in their life are the conversations that they have with family, friends and caretakers. My challenge as an audiologist is to optimize communication function, thus allowing people with hearing loss to participate fully in their life. So let's take a few minutes to learn how to keep hearing aids functioning at their highest level. In maximizing communication function, hearing aids are often the baseline from which all other communication builds. Whether you wear hearing aids yourself or spend time with someone who does, the quality of life improvement gained from a properly functioning pair of hearing aids is well worth a few minutes each day. Hearing aid batteries typically last seven to ten days. However, the time can range from four days to three weeks depending on the size of the battery and the usage. Most hearing aids are equipped with an auditory signal that lets you know when the battery needs to be changed. Although it's not a bad idea to create a routine schedule for maintenance for example, every Monday the battery is changed and the hearing aid is cleaned. There are four battery sizes. During the hearing aid fitting, the correct size battery will be provided. Battery manufacturers have different packaging styles which can be confusing, but the universal thing among all manufacturers is the color of the sticker and the number. 10 is yellow, 
size 312, brown. Size 13 is orange. 675 is blue. Always use fresh batteries and store them in their original packaging. Batteries that are kept loose can short out if they come into contact with other batteries or if they touch other metal objects. First, remove the sticker from the battery. Some people like to then place the sticker on a calendar so that over the course of time they know approximately how many days have gone between changes. Never put a battery inside the shell of the hearing aid. It always goes inside the door. Insert the battery so that the plus sign, or the smooth side of the battery, aligns with the plus sign on the door of the hearing aid. If the door doesn't close, you may have the battery upside down. Close the door, turn the aid on, and check for feedback. Lastly, it's a good idea to collect batteries and return them to the audiologist for proper disposal. Some batteries contain mercury, and if they end up in a landfill, that mercury can wind up in our water supplies. Hearing aids are either turned on via a volume wheel, or the aid is turned on and off by opening and closing the battery door. To determine if a hearing aid is working, you can turn it on and cup it loosely in your hand to produce a whistling sound, which is called feedback. This lets you know that the hearing aid is working. Let's start with in-the-ear hearing aids. These can be many sizes. All the sizes have the same basic function. They are all custom-made hearing aids that have been molded specifically to fit the person's ear. Once you've determined that the hearing aid is working, you can put it in. First of all, determine left from right. Right hearing aids have red writing on them, and left hearing aids have blue. To help you remember this, just think R and R. First, pull up on the canal to straighten the ear. Then take the hearing aid, insert it into the canal, and twist it slowly back while pushing in. When the hearing aid is properly seated in the canal, the edges will touch the ear and there will not be feedback. If there's a volume wheel, and not all aids have them, some are designed to work automatically, twist it towards the nose to turn it up and towards the back of the head to turn it down. Think of the phrase back off to think of turning the hearing aid down. Adjust the volume then to a comfortable listening level. The hearing aids can be worn all day. However, if someone's new to hearing aids, start with wearing them at least four hours each day. Should there be discomfort or pain from the hearing aid, remove it and call your audiologist immediately. To remove the hearing aid, lift the back edge with your thumb and pull it out while twisting forward. The insertion of a behind-the-ear hearing instrument is similar to that of an in-the-ear hearing instrument, but it takes two hands. First, determine the left from the right hearing aid by looking at the ear molds and checking for red writing on the right ear mold and blue writing on the left ear mold. Once you've determined left from right, Ensure that the hearing aid is working by checking for feedback. Begin with inserting the ear mold, and once the mold is properly seated, hold it in place while securing the hearing aid comfortably behind the ear. The motion here is up and over. To remove a behind the ear hearing aid, the basic principle of path of least resistance applies, but do avoid pulling on the tubing because that results in pulling the ear mold apart and thus requiring repair. If there's a volume wheel or rocker switch, then adjust the volume to a comfortable level. Oftentimes, however, a hearing aid is intentionally programmed to have automatic volume changes based on the level of sound in the environment. In this case, there may be no volume wheel at all. Hearing aids should be cleaned weekly or any time the hearing aid stops working. The two most common reasons that hearing aids stop working are dead batteries or wax in the receiver. You should have been given several supplies. First, the spray cleaner. The spray cleaner both sanitizes hearing aids and removes oils and wax that cause the hearing aid or the ear mold to turn brown. When you use the spray cleaner, always spray the cloth and not the hearing aid. Then take the cloth and very simply wipe the hearing aid off. Next, you'll have a cleaning brush. The brush can be used to get dust, debris, out of all of the openings in the hearing aid. 
Never jam the bristles of the brush into the microphone, which is located on the front of the hearing aid. And when you use the brush, turn the aid sideways and gently brush so that any wax or debris inside the hearing aid falls out. Next, you have a wax loop. The wax loop is to be used only in the receiver. The receiver is where the sound comes out of the hearing aid. You take the wax loop, look at the receiver and the hearing aid, and gently insert the loop to pull out any visible wax. The last line of defense to keeping hearing aids working is with your desiccant. The desiccant serves as both storage and maintenance for your hearing aid. The crystals in the desiccant remove moisture from the hearing aids. The humidity in the ear canal is 100% all the time, and humidity in hearing aids don't get along. So when you store your hearing aid, place it inside the desiccant jar. When the desiccant crystals turn blue, it means they're full of moisture and need to be dried out. To do this, simply place the plastic portion of the desiccant in the microwave for 30 seconds. Optimizing communication function involves many key strategies. First, use and maintain hearing aids. Second, avoid situations where communication is very difficult. Third, if you need an amplifier for a television or a telephone, they are available. By following these simple steps, we can maximize communication for the people we care for and keep them actively involved in their life.